You're listening to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 35. This week we are talking about Kemet vs. Cyclades, along with Mystery of the Abbey, Defenders of the Realm, and Demacher. You're listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, a podcast about gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Anthony. Hey, this is Chris. This is Daniel. This is Drew. Welcome to the episode, everybody. Episode 35, the first in our currently weekly podcast. We're back to weekly, so you just heard us last week. We're here again. Uh, we have a pretty cool episode today because we're going to touch back on three games that we mentioned quite heavily in our World Cup of Fantasy Games, uh, <laughs> two of which we got a bunch of flack for not including. In and of, we listened to the flack and we covered it. Exactly. So keep listening. You're going to hear our future review of Kemet and Cyclades together, the sort of verses, one-on-one. I think it's the first time we've done that. I think it is. All right. In the end, there can be only one. And we'll tell you which one it is. <laughs> but you'll have to wait. <laughs> till the end, or you can fast forward. <laughs> uh, we're also talking about Defenders of the Realm, which made it really far in our uh, World Cup. But I'd never played it, so I was annoyed the whole time. And <laughs> You don't say. Yeah, I was. I was a little bit. But it made me really want to play it, so it was awesome we got to the table. We finally got to the table. And it's exactly like another game that you know and love, but we're not going to tell you till later. <laughs> so many secrets. <laughs> Uh, all right, so first off, we're going to jump into the news with probably the biggest board gaming news story in, like, the last, I don't know, year. Honestly, this is a big, big story. Everybody was talking about it. Mm, yeah. Yeah, so if you didn't hear, read, slash, see it online, uh, just this last week, Days of Wonder and Asmodee joined up. Uh, so Asmodee bought out Days of Wonder. They're going to be part of Asmodee now. They're going to be working kind of as their own little subsidiary, so the creative team's going to stay the same. So hopefully that means we see the amazing quality of games from them in the future, but it also means they're going to be getting those Asmodee resources, too, which for them is probably great, you know, distribution overseas and all that. But it's it's a, it was a big story, and at first it seemed like, you know, something you hear out of another industry. It's not a, you don't see a lot of board game companies buying each other up. I wonder if this is the first step in the Hasbroization of the board game industry. Um, are we going to see contraction where there's just going to be a few large game companies? Yeah, I'm wondering about that. Because we saw the same thing with the video gaming industry. Like, if you look back to the 80s when it started to boom, like we're seeing now with board games, mm-hmm. like post-Atari crash, <laughs> the first boom, there was dozens of publishers and do- dozens of different companies making these games, and they started consolidating and closing up, and now there's like four, you know, yeah. four really big companies. And they own all the little smaller studios. Are we going to see something like that? There, there are a lot of boutique companies out there, you know, specific lines, specific themes or mechanics, uh, designers. Um, it would make sense for them to hook on with a, another company that makes different kinds of games, pool their advertising resources, their production facilities. Um, the margins are so, so thin in this industry. Anything which will make it easier for them to keep producing. Yeah. I mean, if you can get to with a big company that can get your games in Target or Barnes & Noble, that could be huge. You know, actually make a living out of it instead of just a hobby. So I know the popular logic about Asmodee acquiring Days of Wonder is that it's a good thing. It'll help Days of Wonder get their games out to a larger audience and hopefully keep the same quality that Days of Wonder is known for. Yeah. Although it does kind of hurt me a little bit because I love the idea of Days of Wonder being its own company and connecting with these small group of people, these dedicated designers and having back so many of their projects either on Kickstarter with the Small World expansions and digital editions or their Ticket to Ride and, and their forums. They're so much like a small family that you're kind of connecting with. I hope they don't lose that because what makes Days of Wonder so special is is their personal touch to everything that they do. And while we haven't seen that loss, let's say, in Fantasy Flight, Fantasy Flight does an excellent job, I am hoping that we don't have a situation like EA Sports 
that just EA <laughs> eats everything up, yeah. and it's just like you like that game. Now EA owns it, and now there's 15 different bad things added to it because of reasons, and that would be bad marketing. Yeah, I, I sort of. In the film world equivalent, I sort of think of Days of Wonder as our Miramax. Very high quality, uh, beloved by, you know, the real serious gamer. And Asmodee is Disney buying it up. (laughs) You know, sure, it's nice to have the distribution, but where's Miramax today? I hope that doesn't happen to uh, Days of Wonder. Well, maybe it'll end up being more like Disney and Pixar or Disney and Marvel, which has been, so far, a pretty good relationship. Hmm, yeah. I do wonder if it's going to change the uh, the landscape of copyright law in board gaming because so far we have seen very little, uh, very very little effort to copyright game mechanics. Yes, and that's partially because I think at least I think that is partially because the small gaming firms lack the power to do so. Right, they don't have sure. the money to put into developing the legal system, like the legal definitions they would need to copyright or trademark things like that Uh, and if you get large firms there may be a change in the way games are produced in the future yeah that's absolutely true I mean without having those gigantic legal departments to defend every iteration of a game mechanic or a quality or a style in some sort of way you have to kind of believe in the goodness of other designers and other publishers and producers and fans that we're all doing this for the right reasons but now I guess once the company becomes so large you have you know, shareholders, and you have to defend them, and you have departments that need to do something, so... Decisions are going to be made on a totally different basis now. Yeah, so, um, this is what fingers crossed, and, uh, it looks good, it doesn't look bad, so there's no reason for giant concern here, but, um, you know. The question is, is, uh, then, from, from our two examples, is Days of Wonder going to be Miramax, or is it going to be Pixar? We'll see. And they're both very good companies, so I, yeah. m- my hope is that this will turn out well. I don't suspect Asmodee has any dark ambitions. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're a board wait, wait, company. Wait. Did yeah. anyone check their alignment before they purchased yeah, these? Yeah. <laughs> they were making this assumption that they're like the evil empire of board right. games. It's like, no, we just really like Days of Wonder. It's yeah. Not, yeah. Uh, I think it'll be good. Yeah, most likely. Right. I'm looking forward to see what they uh, do together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in terms of other news, we don't have a whole lot to talk about, but. We did want to talk about, uh, we had this cool idea for a segment that we didn't quite put together, but we did want to throw a question to everybody out there in listener land. Um, The Labor Day is coming up tomorrow, (laughs) so if you're listening to this right now, it's either Labor Day or tomorrow is, um, or it was this week. And that made us think, what are our favorite worker placement games? So before we say what ours are, and you can probably guess a few just based on our reviews lately... um, I want to pitch to you guys listening to tell us what your favorite worker placement games are. So hit up the forums or hit the uh, thread on boardgamersanonymous.com for this episode, episode 35, and let us know what your favorites are and uh, if there's any we're missing. And yeah. We're going we're gonna, to um, bring them on the air, too. Um, and you, get, you will get double bonus points if there are actual workers involved. <laughs> <laughs> Not just abstract meeples, but... Real workers in those worker placement games. Because nothing says Labor Day like taking the day off to not labor, but spending the entire day thinking about labor (laughs) and worker placement games. I'm off. I don't have to go to work today. But this little guy does. (laughs) No vacation. Uh, That's awesome. Somebody's always working, even if they're little and wooden. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's fun, though. (laughs) <laughs> Says you. Not what about that little wooden guy? Why does he take the day off? He's going questing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. No one ever comes back from Lords of Waterdeep's quest. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Where do they go? Why haven't they come back yet? Those are more cube shaped people. <laughs> That's right. Where are they? Um, yeah, we talked about a lot of our favorites on last week's episode. Uh, just from our favorite games from last year. I think we mentioned three out of our four games were worker placement games. Yes. So this is obviously one of our favorite uh, genres. Um, I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel yeah. doesn't like the best genre. <laughs> hey, hey. Burn. Whoa. Well, I've got a different game, so I'll have a different one. You do. No, you can't one. repeat. Can't repeat from last week. Oh, well, now we have a problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, put your thinking caps on. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, definitely put that in there. We definitely want to hear what your favorites are. But next up, we're going to talk about acquisition disorders. 
Acquisition Disorder Quarter. All right, what is everybody's Acquisition Disorder this week? And we talked about almost everything from Gen Con last week, so you have to come up with something new. <laughs> and go. <laughs> Big challenge. All right, I'll start off with uh, Castles of Mad King Ludwig. So everyone knows the famous Suburbia. It's, it's an outstanding hex placement game where you get special abilities based upon where you place the hexes and the other people's boards and how they combine together to build this wonderful Suburbia. Now, take that and take it from the f- future, like your SimCity future, and take it to the past and actually have the opportunity to build a castle. So, this is pretty interesting. Um, this is Ted Alspeck's next game. Now, m- most people, myself included, when I first heard the details of Subdivision, I was like, this is the next Suburbia expansion. This is going to be great. It looks like Suburbia. It- it plays like suburbia and it's not suburbia this is suburbia this is the next iteration of of suburbia in a really new and interesting way whereas subdivision has the looks but not really the spirit to it i've you know gone through some gameplays of that and it's just doesn't really hold up so i'm really looking forward to this game and you know castles castles are awesome and to actually build a floor plan for a castle is a great idea, and it, if you look at the board and the setup, it it totally reminds you of Suburbia, you know, without the really annoying kind of industrial tiles on the board. Yeah, it looks pretty cool, and every tile is different, right? Yes, and it's a matter of how you line up the rooms. So each of the each of the different rooms are a different shape. So you have round rooms, you have rectangles, and squares, and such, and they have different abilities. But on top of which, they have little doorways. So when you place another room down, you have to match the doorways so that the rooms connect. So that leads to really strange and unique types of combinations of floor plans. So obviously, if you can get everything nice and compact, you're scoring a lot of points because everything connects. If you get things all over the place, it's fun, but probably doesn't score you as many points. So I'm really looking forward to this one coming out. I'm going to pick this up as soon as I see it. Yeah, it looks pretty awesome. And the, just they, they had me sold when they said it was a suburbia with a castle. Yeah. You know? Done. <laughs> like, done. Bought it. <laughs> in the collection. Uh, so there's a couple of games, well, one in particular, that I wanted to talk about last week. Um, but we never let you. Well, I just didn't know it was out. No. Like, no. you just, yeah. You think, I don't know. Are we going to let them talk about it? I don't know. The gag order is <laughs> pretty strict on this one. Because once he starts talking about it, he's not going to stop because this is one of his favorite games. But I want it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I expected fully to hear that uh, Fantasy Flight was going to release expansion or expansions for Battle or Second Edition. Yeah, seriously. What's up with that Fantasy Flight? What are you doing, guys? Release the expansion. Come on, i got to play some elves here. Exactly. So what happened is they did not announce a big expansion. We were Boo. hoping for a second base set with the other two factions from Rune Wars and Descent and all those other games. Um, didn't happen, but they did announce two smaller box expansions, uh, $40 price point, <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, each with uh, a new 50-point um, army in it. So expanding on the existing armies, giving you a lot more options, which is one of the things people talked about missing in the base set. Uh, Basically, a lot more ways to play those same two armies. Now, if you don't like those two armies, you're going to continue to wait for the elves. <laughs> you don't say! <laughs> <laughs> and the undead. Uh, I like those two armies just fine, so I will probably be picking these up. They look cool. So, they're saying by the end of the year, and they tend to hit their dates, so we'll probably see these pretty close around the end of the year. The other big announcement uh, from Fantasy Flight related to Battle Lore is an iOS app. Which I did not expect at all, but it's awesome. So there's an iPad app coming out, uh, Battle or Command, that's going to take this second edition world and turn it into an app. Which will be great, because I think it'll be a good system for that. Wait a minute. Does it, does it have elves? Are there other elves in there? No. Mm, okay, fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you may continue. <laughs> uh, don't know a whole lot about it yet. They just announced it at Gen Con, like right at the end, the tail end of it. But... It looks pretty cool. It's one of my favorite two-player battle games. It's quick. It's easy. It's just it runs really fast. Plus, it's kind of Fantasy Flight's foray into these apps, so it could be like opening the door to a lot of other apps mm. for some of our favorite games that would do extremely well, like any LCG. Um, 
take any of those and throw it in an app, you got a good game. Oh, that would be tremendous. Yeah. So I'm excited. I want this to succeed. I'll, of course, download it and play it like crazy when it comes out. Uh, Chris Will wants the elves are in there. This is uh, this is all I'm asking for. Just elves. That's it. I mean, that's not a lot to ask for. <laughs> They're little. I mean, you could squeeze them in there. Next year, man. <laughs> not fair. Those are my acquisition disorders. I didn't know about it when we recorded last week. They hadn't announced it yet or it hadn't come out, but... Now they're on my list. On my list, uh, Five Tribes from the company that was formerly known as Days of Wonder. <laughs> <laughs> we hope it's still going to be Days of Wonder. Um, really excited about Five Tribes. It's a Arabian Nights set uh, game. And the basic mechanic is one we don't see very often. It's a, a Mancala kind of game where you're taking all the tiles from one space, all your workers... Uh, this is one of these worker displacement games we, we mentioned the other week. And then spreading them ar- across the board, and everybody's doing this. They're trying to move their guys around, one on each tile in a certain direction, to try and gain influence certain parts of the board. Um, each tribe has different skills, and, and your different spaces give you different uh, things. It, I'm not going to get into the whole thing. It just looks fascinating because I love Mancala. Um, it's a mechanic that isn't hit a, a lot, um, and I also love the fact that the designer is Bruno Catala, and the town is set in Nagala, and it has a Mancala. You know, there's a theme here. I love it. Um, I'm excited. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'm sure that the uh, the quality of components and everything is going to be excellent, as always. Does it have elves in it? No. Ah. It has genies. All right, all right. Genies are cool. <laughs> Everyone's got pointed ears. We're good with that. There you go. Uh, for me, my most powerful acquisition disorder right now is, is a game we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes, which is Defenders of the Realm. And since we're going to be talking about it later on in this episode, well, let's just talk about it once. <laughs> does it have elves? Yes. It does have elves. It yes. does. Yes. There you go. All right. Hey, we're back to going, man. Chris already owns it, so. Yes. <laughs> because it has elves. <laughs> because of the elves. Elves. Oh, <laughs> was that an Eric thing? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, it seemed appropriate. Little did you guys know that Chris, during the winter months, will disappear for a little while. He, he disappears somewhere northerly. <laughs> it's, I think it's somehow connected to his obsession with elves. You know, I think it North Pole-y, something like that. <laughs> Chris, Chris, Chris is Santa Claus. That's where we're going. <laughs> Dude! <laughs> Blowing it, man! Oh, those are the rare snow elves, cousins to the wood elves. <laughs> I was raised Jewish, all right? So, Santa Claus or not, whatever. Well, if you're a very good boy, you might get some board games for Christmas. Ho, 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 ho. Talk to me if you ever meet Hanukkah Harry. <laughs> okay. It's a special preview of our holiday episode coming in three months. <laughs> Kicking the Habit. Alrighty, so if you haven't yet, you really need to be listening to Chris's weekly podcast, Kicking the Habit. Every week he's covering hot new Kickstarters, which ones funded, which ones didn't, whether you should back a Kickstarter um, from all the big name ones to ones maybe you haven't heard of. Anyways, it's an awesome podcast. It's up every week on Wednesday. But this week, Chris has a really special guest, Philip DeBerry. The designer of games like Revolution, Canalis, Cordier, he's got an awesome new looking Kickstarter game called Skyway Robbery. Uh, basically, it's a steampunk Ocean's Eleven style heist game, and you can imagine where that goes. So, Chris talks with him for a little bit about what the game is, where it comes from, some of the inspirations, lots of cool stuff. We've got a really cool sneak peek for you today, just a, one of the questions Chris asks. But definitely check that out on Wednesday when it hits iTunes and our website, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. All right, well, I'm glad to have Philip DeBerry here. And uh, as I told Philip online through emails that his games actually has a very unique history in Board Gamers Anonymous. It was his revolution game that actually brought three of the original hosts together, which is quite surprising because if you ever had a chance to play Revolution, there's it's kind of really cutthroat. And, uh, you know, um, one of our hosts, Drew, was asking, you know, Philip... We really want to know, when you created this game, did you worry at all that you were destroying families and lives? 
Well, I, I started with my own family, so uh, <laughs> at least I uh, stress tested it uh, as much as I could. Are you are you still speaking to them now yeah. at this point? Yes, they're, they're all still on good terms. Uh, there are a few people who will not play with me anymore, but uh, <laughs> other than that, uh, everything's fine. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. And it was just, you know, just from the very start playing Re- Revolution, because it really does have that nice gateway feel where it doesn't seem too intimidating, it doesn't seem too AP heavy, and as you play the game, you do really get drawn into it, and it really does want you to kind of knock out that other guy and, and win that area, and it's, it's really fun and entertaining. And, uh, you know, through our, each of our histories, all the gift different games that we played, we were always really engage, you know, constantly engaged throughout the game with the theme, and when I saw that Skyway Robbery popped up on Kickstarter, I jumped immediately into that game because your tradition of those th- truly rich and thematic games and yet high quality components is really a, a great mark for the board game industry. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I, I, I actually don't think of Revolution as having a super strong theme, so that's kind of cool that, that, you, that you think so. Um, if you think that has a, a strong theme, Skyway Robbery is going to uh, knock you down because the theme there is, is way beyond anything I've ever done before. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that. So right off the bat, we're talking steampunk, right? Well, I mean, that's kind of the, uh, I guess that's that's the uh, the framework that, that everything's sort of wrapped around. Um, but what we do is we take the uh, kind of the classic steampunk kind of, you know, things that you expect, and we, we have those. But uh, at the heart of the game, it's about a heist. And so really... Um, what it is, it's about, uh, it's sort of like Ocean's Eleven, where, they, where you're gathering your crew together to go and rob different places. And um, the uh, steampunk theme has allowed us to put everybody on this big airship, and it's flying around to these far flung locations. And we've been able to really, you know, expand out on what we can do as far as art and fantasy and just, uh, just really go all out in, in crazy directions. Um, with with the theme and the story of all these people trying to do this and uh, it, I don't know, it's really it seems like it, it's, everything's sort of come together. Alright, so don't forget to check out the full interview between Chris and Philip DeBerry out on Kicking the Habit, episode 11, September 3rd. Next up, the games we've been playing lately. At the table this week. All right, so our first game that we're going to talk about today is a game we got in uh, maybe a couple weeks ago when we went to the uh, board gaming group in Jersey. Yep. New Jersey board gamers. Love those guys. Yeah, so we were at Menlo Park Mall, and um, I had not seen this game before. It's, I guess Days of Wonder picked it up and reprinted it, but so they made it look really pretty. It's a little bit older. And it is Mystery of the Abbey. So this is a kind of induction-style game going back to, you know, we had a clip not too long ago on Dice Tower talking about logic games, this was probably mentioned among all those top ten entries because it is you're just trying to solve a puzzle, basically. So everybody gets a little card with like all these different monks and brothers on it, and then you have to try to figure out who the murderer is because there's been a murder. Bum, bum, bum. Based on the cards that you see in your hand. So you have a hand of cards, have different brothers in them, uh, and novices and fathers, and you're going to pass them around and move them and swap cards with other people and draw new cards, and there's one card hidden underneath the board. So the goal is to figure out what that one card is before anybody else. Mm-hmm. It's Clue! It's just Clue! It's a rethink of Clue! <laughs> it's a lot like Clue, yeah. It's a <laughs> lot like Clue. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of cool little tweaks to it. Um, there are ways to steal from your neighbors. There are ways to mess with their cards. There are... Um, different cards that allow you to do special actions, uh, things like searching through the deck or drawing a bunch of extra cards or taking someone's entire hand and looking at it. Um, stuff like that. that just The goal is basically to get more information than anybody else faster than them. And the more information you get, the closer you get to solving it. But that doesn't necessarily mean you win because you can score points throughout the game by guessing various traits. So there's a bunch of different traits that exist in there. So fat, skinny, bald, bearded, um, brother, different. Franciscan. Franciscan. Yeah. So you guess, you go and you guess one of those in a special room on the board, 
And if you're right at the end of the game, you get points for that. If you're wrong, you lose points. So if you just go guess like five times and get them all right, even if you never figure out who it is, you could win the game. And you get a lot more points if you are the first person to guess who it actually is. And that's one of the good parts of that game, too, is if you make educated guesses and if you are correct, you can actually beat the person who actually guessed who the murderer was. So when the game ends, it doesn't really end because you still have to count the points up. So it makes it a little bit different than Clue in that way. Um, It does have these mechanics where you have a certain number of turns and then there's time to go back and pray. So it pulls you all back. So... The board's pretty small. It's really well designed. The pieces are great. It's Days of Wonder, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, this is a Days of Wonder game. You understand what that means. All of the components are high quality. The rule book, everything's beautiful in this game. And it plays very tight. There, there really is no fat to this game at all. It's, you know what you're doing. It makes sense. It's very thematic. And it's a lot of fun. And it does, it does kind of, you know, harken back to Clue, which is not a bad thing. Clue's a great game. So. But levels of complexity beyond that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It makes me glad to know that it's not just Clue in a convent, because honestly, I never really enjoyed Clue that much. It was it was very clearly a children's game, right? And I don't, I don't think it scales up terribly well, and it's very dry. And I always thought that was weird, that, that there was a children's game about murder. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what are you doing, Billy? Well, it turns out the Colonel Mustard used a lead pipe mm. on <laughs> I'm like, I think you were playing it wrong. I mean, <laughs> we were brutally competitive about this. I yeah. mean... But not for children, about murder? Who there was, murdered somebody? There, there was a whole thing about uh, which card should I show them? And, <laughs> yeah, a lot of layers for a kid. I think that was one of the most complex games I played as a youngin. I really? Think, so. I mean, this was in the era where they kept trying to train kids to be detectives, right? This is the Hardy <laughs> right. Boys. This is uh, Nancy Drew. Nancy Drew, right? Scooby Doo. Scooby Doo. They're just trying to get kids <laughs> to be detectives, which is honestly horribly irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's a, there's a murder, kids. Go figure it out. I'm sure it'll work out for you. <laughs> Bunch of six year olds wandering around a murderer's house. It's going to turn out great. But well, wasn't that uh, what Stand By Me? They find there's a dead body and they go all the way out to to, to touch the dead body and figure out. Yeah, that was poke it with it. Yeah, yeah, poke it with a stick. Responsible culture. Yeah. Yeah, go. <laughs> yep. So that was a kind of fun, interesting game. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. It was um, it was cool too because it was like a week after we recorded that other thing where we we're talking about these kind of games. And it's not like heavy logic, but you do have to kind of try to figure it out based on these various factors and. Like, even how you make your guesses is kind of, like, logically. You're like, well, there's five possibilities here and two here. So it's probably one of these, but you could still be wrong. You don't know. You said one of my favorite words, Anthony, reprint. Um, (laughs) This was, uh, I just looked it up. This was originally published in 1995. So always happy when forgotten games are brought back into print and uh, kept alive. Yeah, and it was fun because as you're making decisions, you're narrowing down who the possible murderer is. And at the end of the game, it was almost a race. Like, everyone's trying to get down there to, to get the last guess at it. And I just I got there probably one or two steps before everybody else did. There were three of us that knew who it was and yeah. got there first. Yeah. yeah, so that was kind of fun, too. Yeah. There are a couple of cards in the game that are a little annoying things that are like, everybody go back. And you're like, no, come on. I just negated, like, three turns. Because you can't actually get to some of the rooms in one turn. Um that's a 90s game for you. That's what's going to happen. It's, sure. It wasn't that bad. It only happened a couple times. Didn't ruin the game. It kept it pretty well balanced between everybody. So, yeah, I mean, if you have a chance to play this and you like that kind of game, if you like Clue, uh, this is like a more slightly more grown-up version of that. I think it's a good game. Yeah, this is a play for me as well. Probably not a buy because you're doing a lot of the same things from game to game. There really isn't much strategy as far as what decisions to make. But it is fun and kind of interesting to kind of narrow down. And I was, I think Anthony and I had, I think you had someone different, at least originally. And I, and I was like, I think it's the other, you and I had picked different, different uh, people. And then it came down to, and I kept narrowing down. That was kind of fun and interesting. It's like, you're getting that information, and it's, come, it's becoming clear yeah. at that point. So the game is fun, it's worth the play, and you should check it out. All righty, Daniel, you already previewed this game, so I'm going to let you take it away. All right, so my at the table this week is one that we all got to sit down and play together, along with uh, two other folks from the Bergen County meetup over in New Jersey. It was a great time. Uh, hi to everybody there, if you're listening anyway. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> you're awesome. Uh, Defenders of the Realm is a 
pandemic style cooperative game with a, gr- uh, a greater deal of complexity than pandemic uh, and a high fantasy classic d and d theme and it is just a ton of fun um, it is one of the best times I've had board gaming in a very long time. Told you. <laughs> <laughs> no one disagreed. <laughs> yeah, you're a little iffy about it. Yeah, if only because only one of us had played the game and it made two. it to number two. That's how good the game is. It doesn't even. <laughs> the game is so good, no one even needs to play I, it. <laughs> I agree now. I agree. I played it. I loved it. All right, Daniel. We're, we kind of. Sorry. Jump no, there. not at all. It's. I mean, we all played it together, and I think we all had a pretty fantastic time. I mean, we even got we got our asses kicked by the game, and we had a fantastic time. I got my ass kicked by the game. That's true. Anthony got all of our asses kicked by the game. Aww. <laughs> I did lose the game for everybody. Oh, Anthony, come on, man, come on. No, but I mean, even losing and losing pretty badly, it was a very, very fun game. And that, for me, is the hallmark of a good game, right? If if it's fun even when you're losing. And it was so fun that I actually didn't even feel like a loss to me at the end. It was like, oh, well, I guess the game's over now. But I didn't feel like I lost or got beaten. It's just, oh, it just ended in an undesirable way. You know, another thing in its favor is um, it, it makes makes one think of another game very similar. Uh, and any time that the game you're comparing it to is Pandemic, you know it's a good game. Um, it's a fantasy game pretty much uh, in the order of pandemic um, very similar should Matt Laycock um, sue <laughs> or I mean it's really similar but. you know you said that like as he was teaching the rules like the first five or ten minutes yeah. because it's got that one mechanic where minions come onto the board and if there's too many in a space it spreads so the second you see that you're like pandemic it's pandemic it's the exact same thing as pandemic. <laughs> I've seen this before but then you get into the next 20 minutes of the rules and you're like it's pandemic plus like five hundred other things, so yeah. he's fine. This guy's fine. A lot of layers of complexity. We talked about adding complexity to Clue. Well, this adds levels of complexity to Pandemic, um, so much so that the the problem of the alpha player is eliminated in, in games of Pandemic. You're sometimes going to have one guy telling everybody else what to do. You can't do that. There's no way you can barely keep a grip on your own character and what he's got going on. So the need for cooperation here is so much greater. Everybody's got to get a grip on what they're doing and work together closely. What I really like about the game is I mean, we talked about Pandemic. This is better than Pandemic. And especially because in Pandemic, you're taking an action to do something to clean up the virus, you know. But here... You're fighting minions, and you do have to roll dice in order to be successful. And depending on the type of minion, you have to roll a certain number or better. That's so much fun. It's not like a foregone conclusion. And like Drew was saying about the alpha player, you know, if it is a puzzle, even Pandemic can be alpha player because there are certain things you need to do. It's obvious. There's some randomness, so it does add some possibility to it. But... You have the possibility of winning a battle, even if you're completely outnumbered, or conversely, you could be, you know, you could have everything that you need and not and roll so badly throughout the battle, which could happen can... that you would get wiped out. So there's so much possibility. Each of the heroes plays uniquely different, which is so much fun. When you're playing the wizard, he plays like the wizard. When you're playing the rogue, plays like the rogue. And You know, and it's not that type of game where if you don't play a certain class or a certain number of classes, because this game comes with a number of different classes, and the expansion has more classes and so on and so forth, but you can really play pretty much whatever you want and still have a really good chance to victory. I don't think any of our classes really let us down in the game. No. Um, You mentioned the randomness. I don't want to scare anybody off because of that. There is some randomness, but there's a lot you can do during the course of the game to improve the odds, whether it's through cooperation or going on quests to get certain uh, powers or amulets or things. Um, But, of course, every time you go on a quest to try to improve your strength, you're not fighting the enemy and you're not helping out your buddies. So there's a real fine line of improving yourself and helping. It's just really cool how it manages to bring in that stand-up dice-throwing moment where everybody's, like, waiting on the one roll. (laughs) The one roll. And multiple times we erupted in cheering, which... 
I am generally annoyed when people do that in gaming stores, and I was among the cheering because it was that it was that tense. It was awesome. And when was the last time you had that kind of emotional reaction to a game where it's just like a dice roll? I want just ero- erupted. Yeah, and a lot of co-op games, if you win it, everybody cheers. Yeah. But it's a puzzle, and it's usually alpha-gamed, and honestly, I don't like a lot of co-ops for that reason. Everyone is invested in this game. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I know why it's on your acquisition disorder list. It's almost on mine, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. I mean, it, it's only weak points to me are it's it's very expensive. It, it runs 80 to $90, depending on where you can find it. Of course, you, if you find it on sale for less than that... You should probably it's make a, a move. And to be fair, it's a big game. Oh, wait, you you're get a lot. You're it. getting a huge board. You're getting a number of miniatures in the game. You're getting numerous decks, and the mechanics are great by Richard Lanius. We saw the expansion also, so yes. that made it even bigger. Well, yeah, there's the dragon expansion too that's already out, and that replaces the general with four dragons and some additional complexity and some actual kind of missions to go on. But there are also three hero expansions where you can actually add more heroes to the game. And I love this game so much, I picked up the base game, the heroes, and the dragons. All right. <laughs> All right. So we're going to play it again, because Chris has it. Yes. Yeah. And Daniel it, will probably have it someday, and then I'll probably get it, too, because he's got miniatures. So. It's <laughs> yeah. Painting party. <laughs> the, the only other weakness of this game, though, for me, is it's, it's very complex, which is also its strength. So sure. the one place it's going to lose to Pandemic is I would never, ever bring this one out. To get a new gamer into the hobby, <laughs> I feel like it, unless they, I mean, I mean, if they play D anD D or anything like that, if they were a gamer somewhere, you could bring them in here. But if they didn't have a gaming background, it would be absolutely overwhelming. If you had somebody who who loved Pandemic and played it over and over again, and each time we played it more difficult settings, made it more of a challenge, but they felt like they want something more. Do you think Defenders of the Realm is a good link, or is it too much of a jump beyond Pandemic? I think it's a good move from casual, even though that's not really a term I like, but from people who play hobby games infrequently uh, and mostly on the lighter end into the deeper end Fantasy. of the hobby. It's on yeah. the deeper end. I mean, it's not Warhammer 40K can, deeper end, but it's on the deeper end of the hobby. So can you make the jump directly, or do you need an in-between game? To I almost want to say you need an in-between game, but I can't think of a good one. I mean, to be fair, you get your hero, typically he has three or four powers, and the comp- the powers aren't that complex. They usually are based upon something that's thematic to the class, but also plays a role in the game, and your life counters are your actions. So you flip one, you move a space, or you do whatever the special abilities, you flip one, so forth and so on. I don't think the game is that complex, but I hear what you're saying, Daniel. You should have some hobby gaming type of experience to really get the most out of this, because it's not mathematical or kind of puzzly, where like pandemic, you just oh, this is exploding. I need to go here. Yeah. But even during the game, having the general starting to march on, you know, the city is just amazing. You're like, uh oh, we're we're in really trouble here. <laughs> I think if you played pandemic on a harder mode or with many a couple of the expansions thrown in, you'd be ready to move up. And I think if you'd played Flashpoint. Uh, with some of the what are the expert rules, the ones where you have the hot spots and all of that, you you are clearly capable of handling the kind of complexity you'll find here. But to be fair, for me, I love this. I only kind of like Pandemic. Pandemic kind of it's just it just kind of lets me down a little bit. But I I do absolutely agree with uh, Flashpoint probably being a closer connection with that because it does have more thematic roles and kind of character play. Well, and it, I mean, I think it's definitely a better game than Pandemic. Yeah. But, but uh, I also think that Pandemic would give you the basic skill set you need to move up. Sure. You can teach Pandemic in 10 minutes. Yeah. And it's a very easy to learn game. And it's a good way to hook your friends who aren't gamers. Oh, let's play Pandemic. And they're like, oh, I really liked that one. Then, you know, a few weeks down the road, you pull out Defenders of the Realms. Oh, it's like Pandemic. You'll love it. <laughs> and they're like, ah, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> All right. So. Is this a buy, a play, a dodge, or a dreaded burn? <laughs> it is definitely, at the very least, a play. Uh, I want to buy it. I, I need more money first, but <laughs> then I would like to buy it. Is there, can, a, is there a certain price point you'd pick this up at? Uh, I think if I saw it 70 or under, I'd be fighting my urge to perk this very, very uh, strongly. It'd be difficult to, to stop myself there. Even at normal price point, it's kind of hard to hold back. 
All right, so for this last game, we're going to introduce kind of a new, not feature, but kind of like a corner of our At the Table segment. Um, every week now, we're going to try to put the spotlight on a game that is not necessarily new, not necessarily even in print or available, just something um, maybe you've heard it a lot and haven't gotten a chance to play it. Maybe it's a classic that you hear people constantly talking about or comparing other games to, or maybe it's a game that you hear tale of but have never seen or had a chance to play. Um, so we're going to, you know, this is going to be like our little classics feature. Uh, and this week, Drew's going to kick it off with one that he wanted to play for a very long time. <laughs> as soon as I heard about D-Mocker, uh, spelled D-I-E, but pronounced D-Mocker, I wanted to play it. It was a really complex early German game from 1986. Uh, finally made it to print in 2006 in America. Um, and it's just about a European election in Germany, uh, regional elections. Nothing too fancy. It just uh, was an incredible combination of theme and mechanic. Um, it's not a, a true-to-life simulation of an election, but it comes close enough. There's enough decisions in there requiring how do you spend money on media and what's your party platform, how are you going to appeal to voters, um, to really keep you going through four or five hours that it takes. You never lag. It's a long game. I'm going to introduce it to you guys at some point. And, and thankfully, our dear friend John McCallion, who's opened up his uh, collection to us, um, has let me borrow it and play it. And uh, I, I love it. It's out of print. A Canadian company, I think, uh, did it in 2006. So it, it's not strictly a buy. I couldn't tell you to buy it, but I will tell you to look for it and trade for it. There are some copies that are available for trade on the Internet. Um, some big, heavy game that you've played a few times you want to you wanna swap. Uh, I recommend getting it and trying it a few times. Very complex, very immersive, and very interactive. The whole game, you're interacting with the four players, up to four players, um, because every decision you make affects them. Everything they do affects you. Um, I, I can't say anything better about a game like that. It keeps everyone involved for the entire five hours. <laughs> Would you say it's combative in how everybody interacts? Is, is there a lot of tension? Two different things. Tension, yes, because votes are on the line, and votes will determine the, the final, you know, who, who, gets the, uh, who gets to win that state. Not combative because at certain points you're going to have to have coalitions. In any multi-party government, you've got coalitions. Uh, the only way you're going to win that particular election is by joining up with another party. So you don't want to make enemies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I see, I see. So it's, I mean, if it's out of print, um, it's obviously an older game. So if someone's listening to this and hasn't played it, probably most people, except none yeah. of us have played it, what would you compare it to? You know, not necessarily new, but something more people have likely played. A political, well, I, I put this under political. Um, there's the election of the president, 1960, uh, which is, is that what it's called? The election of the president? Something like that. It's about the 1960 election. I think that's the best um American political game that we have. But that's basically a two-sided game. You had Republicans and Democrats. Um, this is more complex. It adds levels of complexity to it. So if you like political games like that, like the 1960 game, give this a try. Yeah, I know you've been talking about this for a very long time, so I'm glad you got a chance to play. I know okay. we definitely want to try it out sometime. Okay. Alrighty, so that is uh, all of our At the Table features this week. Next up, we're going to talk about two games that, once again, did not make our Fantasy uh, World Cup, but are fantastic games in their own right. Kemet and Cyclades. One of them's a fantastic game in its own right, and you'll find out which one in, like, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and now... And now for the feature review... All right, for this week's feature review, we have two amazing games for you. Same publisher, same type of mythological world being brought to your table, Kemet and Cyclades. So first off, let's talk about the game that originally started all, Cyclades. Now, Cyclades is a really interesting game because it is all about Greek mythology in a really interesting and innovative way. So in Cyclades... The main mechanic here is going to be bidding. You are going to be bidding at the Temple of the Gods. Now, the base game has Poseidon, Ares, Zeus, Athena, and Apollo. 
And we also had the opportunity to play with Hades, who comes into play at several different moments in the game, just to kind of muck things up a little bit. There were also mythological creatures and heroes that come into the game, too, with the expansion. So there are a lot of different possibilities that, when you play the game, it plays differently each and every time. There's also divine favors, and the board itself is really unique and interesting because it's unlike any board that I've ever seen. Instead of those kind of boring kind of hexes that you see in most games, it has this beautiful look of the Greek Isles, and the board kind of has a combo thing where, depending on which side, you kind of flip the board, and it's actually two board pieces. You can make a two-player, a three-player, a four- or a five-player, so the game scales really nice. The miniatures are really high quality, and each race, each of these different colors, actually has its own mini sculpt. So you won't look like anybody else in the game, which is really nice. With the Hades expansion, you set the game up, you'll pick the territories based upon bidding, and then as the game goes on, you will be putting money towards the gods to win their favor. Now, let's say, for example, I want ships. Now, obviously, Poseidon's going to handle that, and I bid five to get Poseidon. Well, looks like Daniel also needs ships, so he's going to bid six. Now, I can't bid seven. I actually have to take my marker off and bid on one of the other gods, which might knock out somebody who's already there. So it goes around and around, and the bidding gets higher and higher. And what's the challenge here is, is that by winning the favor of that god, you get to take that action that round. So Poseidon built ships, and you can have fleet battles. Ares built troops, and you can have troop battles. Zeus allows you to get priests and to build mythological creatures for much less. Athena lets you recruit philosophers and build a university. And Apollo, Apollo's always there with prosperity to help you generate some money. The Hades, obviously, with the expansion, is a little bit different because he allows you to build undead troops and undead ships, which is really fun in the game and kind of tears things up a little bit. So after you do the offerings, you're going to move on to taking the actions that the gods gave you. So you're going to be able to attack. You're going to be able to build. If you are able to build four of the required buildings, you'll build a metropolis. Whoever controls two metropolis at the end of the game wins. So you can build the buildings to build a metropolis. You can also turn in philosophers to build the metropolis. And some of the cards in the game, the heroes, will actually give you opportunities based upon special conditions to build a metropolis. Now, if you're not really interested in building, you could always take over someone else's metropolis. And that happens off in this game, too. So that is Cyclades. On the other side is Kemet. So where we moved from the land of the waters now to the land of the desert. And this Egyptian mythology is brought to life in the same high quality miniatures of all of these creatures that come into the game. Now, this game is, a, is slightly different because it has a worker placement mechanic where you're given this board and it has a pyramid. And based upon where you place one of these five little tokens, you'll be able to take an action such as move, attack, upgrade your pyramid, and I should mention about the periods, are actually a D4, which is brilliant in this game. So you get this little city, you get this, these three D4s, and you're able to up-power your pyramid, which will actually let you choose from that appropriate row of special ability tiles in the game. Now, those special ability tiles give you things like prayers, which are the currency in this game and allows you to purchase different things such as recruiting troops, buying other tiles, upgrading your pyramids, and several other things. Now, the combination of tiles you put together, whether they're offense, defense, or utility, allows your troops to do a number of different things, including rec recruiting those mythological creatures that will battle with you and give you special abilities in this game. Now, in this game, what you're really looking for is victory points. Now, like with most battle games, you tend to kind of want to turtle until your moment. In Kemet, that's really the opposite of what you want to do. You actually want to be attacking throughout the whole game. If you win a victory, you get a, you get a victory point that will stay with you throughout the game. If you control certain locations, or if you have your pyramids at level 4, you will control temporary victory points, which can be taken away from you. First person to eight victory points wins the game. Kemet's really interesting and very dynamic, and it's always nice to see those creatures and the dynamicism of all the tiles and how they come into play. Well, that's the Clades, and that's Kemet. Let's see what everyone thought about them. So Kemet and Cyclades, uh, I know people talk about these in the same breath a lot because they both come from the same... <sighs> Kemet and Cyclades! <laughs> <laughs> uh, they both come from the same publisher. They are different designers, which is very obvious when you play both of them yes. back-to-back, -back, which we did. Um, but the same 
same publisher, same size box. They even have a shared expansion where you can cross over the creatures from one to the other. Um, so the question is always, which one should I try? And honestly, in my opinion, they're completely different animals. Like these are not even remotely the same type of game. Cyclades is 80% auction mechanic and a little bit area control. Kemen is fight, 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 some worker placement, and hopefully you get the right tiles for your strategy. It's some tableau building. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very different types of games. Um, and Kemet's quicker. Kemet is much more aggressive. Uh, Cyclades is, uh, it can, I don't know if it drags necessarily. It definitely plays longer than they tell you it's going to play, but it's because of that auction mechanic, it's so much more just open interaction before you actually do anything. So you don't actually feel like you're doing as much. Whereas in Kemet, you're constantly doing things because if you're not doing things, you're not scoring points. (laughs) So it's, very, very different in almost every way you can imagine, except maybe the themes. It's kind of interesting that they decided to cross them over, probably just because they come from the same publisher. Yeah. Um, Synergy. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, production value on both games is outstanding. Yeah. 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 Oh, comparing the two, um, for example, the battle sequences, I think that shows you why one game is far superior. Um, Kemet, the battles are so often in doubt because they have that card playing mechanic i know it's in a couple other games i know um uh, game of thrones card game for, for example where you're you're playing a strategy card in addition to your your armies and that determines the, the outcome so the outcome is really in doubt you don't know what the other person's playing um whereas in cyclades it's pretty much you're going to win the battle you know exactly what you need to win and there's no suspense there. Unless you, you get lucky with a die, but that's... that's uh, yeah. But, well, the die is only one to... Zero, zero to three? Zero, zero to two. three. Two zeros, two, yeah. two ones, or two and three. There's not much. Not even a six. They designed they, the dice to reduce variability, so... Yeah. yeah. So you know you're going to lose. It's That's over. <laughs> um, so you just have this feeling of impending doom. As soon as you get one of the two metropolises needed to win the game, you know someone's going to take it over. So... Um, you have that sword hanging over your head, whereas uh, Kemet, it's in doubt. You really have to marshal your forces. You have to use your strategy cards wisely. Uh, much more tension in that game. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Cyclades, so there's a lot of buildup because it takes so much just to build a metropolis. Um, it does end kind of quickly when you get to that point because if you get two or three metropolises out there... Two. Oh, you need well, if you, if well, just on, on the board. board. Oh, on the board, three, yeah. Yeah, so people might fight over them. But it's not going to last very long because, like you said, the battles are very, you know, and it, yeah. and it has opposite gameplay as far as the victory conditions. But it's basically what we're talking about here because in Kemet, if you start rolling early and you got a couple of permanent victories, you know, picking up the temporary ones aren't very hard. And you could, you know, once you get five or six, you kind of got the game. Whereas Cyclades, while maybe the battles aren't kind of open to possibility. But the victory condition is because since the metropolises are so usually poorly defended because you only have a certain number of troops, you can really sweep in there with a special mythological creature or the right attack or you move in with Hades and you pick up the other metropolis. So it's always kind of open. The battle really happens at the bidding mechanic. That's the best part of the game. Yeah, because yeah. it's not it's not really the battles. Now, I would I would debate the fact there is some randomness because the di- it could come up somewhat different time to time, but it's more strategy than tactics because I got to I have to know what you're going to be doing next. If I see a line of ships to my island, I got to stop you from getting ha- Ares because you're going to roll right in. So, that's where a lot of the gameplay actually happens and takes place. Yeah. 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 It's definitely designed around the bidding mechanic. But once that's done, I think that's it's not enough to really make that a strong game overall. It's just one mechanic that's really cool, but I don't think it has anything else going for it. Yeah, I mean, Cyclades says it's an awesome bidding mechanic, and it's got beautiful pieces, right? beautiful components. Uh, and it will have that every single turn you play, essentially the exact same. That, that's my fundamental problem with Cyclades is it doesn't change. Gameplay well, they, doesn't open or close or divert. It's the same sort of thing every day. Well, there's five gods and you're only bidding on four at any one time. Only if you only have four players. If it, you have more players, that more gods come up, right? Well, it depends on how many players you're going to play. Right. You know, so a, a god will 
shut down. The gods will shuffle yeah. and be in different spots. Hades will come into play. You'll have the the divine kind of you know bonuses to certain characters. The mythological creatures probably adds the probably the most to the gameplay. Like you were you were saying, like the gods are kind of standard. They kind of flip in and out. They kind of take different spots. But the mythological creatures, how they come out, is really what you need to keep an eye on. But, now, but uh, I think they they tend to ruin the game. The, the Kraken. There are a couple of creatures that are almost game breakers in how powerful they are. Pegasus will win you the game, especially if it comes in later in the game. the game breaking mark. <laughs> no, <laughs> not that. Um, well, I'm not going to step out of line on that. I'm just saying. To Drew. <laughs> yes. I don't you think know, they're game breaking. Peg, well, Pegasus, you know, that's you win the game if you're, and we should, you get that at the right time. And we it's should over. mention Pegasus is one of the mythological creatures in the game that allows you to move your troops from any of the islands to anywhere else on the board, so it kind of skips over that whole ships and Ares mechanic and kind of puts you right there. Now, the other the other creature, the Kraken, dis- wipes out fleets, and a lot of them. I used it on you. Yes. You resurrected. You used it on me. But to be fair... Now, they- how many metropolises did you and I build during that game? But to be fair... Zero. Those guys built the metropolises. You see, that took us right out of the game. But to be fair, you only need two. <sighs> You only need two... Metropolis, is it? Yeah, but we you know, we wiped each other out. Well, that's the point of this game, too, which, the same thing as Kemet, if you enter this game thinking it has... I mean, it does have somewhat of the risk mechanic, you're, you're attacking each other's armies, but if that's what you're going for, area control, this is these are not area control games. Mm-hmm. So you're wasting a lot of time trying to control a lot of the areas, while it does can get you some temporary victory points... You really want to go after the, the victory points is really the goal. Yeah, I mean, though, in fairness, when we were playing Kimmet, I played it as an area control game and won. Right. You, there is a way to turtle and get victory points. Well, you and had you turtle and take you started with a good engine, though. Like, yeah, your engine t- was... Yeah, like right. the tiles you pulled, that's the game. And here's the fundamental difference between Kimmet and Cycladius for me. Kimmet changes from turn to turn as players acquire new powers. Mm. Th- doors are opened and doors are closed, and other players and yourself are learning what you can do every turn, right? You have to relearn your abilities, and you have to relearn the board. And that makes it this really exciting gameplay. You have to have a long-term strategy and also be able to adapt quickly. Cyclades, you just sort of do the same thing until Pegasus shows up or until you find some, that, that one thing that will swing it. But that's yeah. not strategic or tactical or honestly no. even interesting to me. Well, to be fair, the, other, the problem with Kemet is on the opposite way, and I do like playing Kemet, is just like the victory points, when you picked up a certain tile that I was going to go for, that was pretty much it. Because once you build a certain tableau that's working for you, or if you have a certain number of victory points, the game is kind of already done. No, I didn't... I, I don't agree as far as Kemet. Because I, I thought the three of you guys all were in it and had a chance to win. I didn't have a, a shot at it. But <laughs> I, could, I was watching you guys, watching the scores. That's because of the dual function of the victory points, permanent and temporary. Um, and if someone gets too many permanent, then they start ganging up on him to pull the temporaries away. So there, there's something you can do to try and slow people down, even if they're building an engine. Um, I think the game stretched out a little longer in a good way because of that, because we were all watching each other's victory points. I mean, and, and you know, I built an engine, but right, it's not the only engine you can build. It was, in no. fact, it was a kind of unusual engine. There are lots of engines you can build, and it's a race to the finish, right? Everyone trying their own strategy and how they deal on the board, and sometimes it comes down to luck. But it's it feels very high stakes, right? Every time turning over the cards felt like something was on the line. I didn't feel there was a turn going by where I even felt like, aha, I've got you all now, oh, until yeah. the very last round. And I went, all right, I got it. Well, first off, let's say, you know, we, we're reviewing two games here, obviously, and the idea was to compare them. But, yeah. A, Kemet or Cyclades, if you're going to pick one, and then B, independently, pretend you didn't play them together. Okay. What do you think of each game? Because I don't think it's necessarily fair, if you like one better, to compare the two, because they aren't the same game. It's not like we're comparing you know, two games of the exact same mechanic. We're talking about two games that just happen to be spoken about together a lot. And they're very expensive, so people and, generally pick one or the other. And I think that's probably the at least the best initial advice we can give you if you're either choosing to buy these games or choosing to play these games. Like Anthony was saying, since they're often spoken in the same breath and because the expansion kind of ties them together 
and it does have somewhat similar mechanics. You might think that they're interchangeable, but they're really very different games. Whether you love one and hate one, or like them both, or hate them both, whatever, they do they do play differently. I'll go first, because um, basically Cyclades, I would rate as a play, because it has that really, really cool auction, gra- what I call a graduated auction mechanic. Think of um, uh, Power Grid, if everybody was bidding on all four, uh, all of us were bidding on all four of those power plants at the same time, um, bidding each other up and up and up. I love that, but the game ended too quickly. You know, somebody gets two Metropolises, bang, right away, it's over. Um, that wasn't satisfying, but I just I loved all throughout the game being able to bid. Kemet definitely a keeper because there's a lot of ways to win, uh, and you can try something different every time you play. Uh, I don't think I'd get bored with it for a long time, so that's a buy. Uh, Kimmet is an amazing game. It has a, a chance to sit in the pantheon of favorites for me, while Cyclades had an interesting bidding mechanic and some pretty miniatures that I would very much like to use in a better game. Uh, I, I think Kimmet outstrips it in every competition possible. I'd rather play Kimmet while getting hit in the head occasionally <laughs> than play Cyclades. Not that bad, man. You know, and maybe objectively, it like there's... You can see thought went into it. You can see beautiful artwork. It was just so dull, though. Let's talk about Kemet first, because dull. The board is dull. The board is probably one of the dullest boards I've ever seen on such a high-quality game. When you look at the tiles in this game, when you get to build this tableau, the tiles are beautiful. They're, the artwork is incredible. The graphic design makes sense. The symbols aren't too crazy. You can kind of figure out without looking at the rule book probably what they do. The miniatures are great, and the board looks like garbage. The board looks like someone sketched it out and then said, I'm going to come back to this, and then someone shipped it out without them coming back and doing the fine detail on it. You have these giant sections, which they kind of roped out in white lines, which kind of bothers me in the game. When you play different players, when you play the smaller amount of players on the board, you only play half the board. So it's half of the board you never get to play at all, which is kind of odd because you're looking at it and there's these temples and you can't go there. But you have to scale. I mean, it has to scale somehow. Well, I think Cyclades does scale well because of the way the board flips. It does. You can play the whole board. Okay. It just makes the board smaller instead of cutting it in half. Yeah. Yeah. I do find the worker placement aspect kind of uninspiring you know it's kind of like they're the same things you'll be taking every turn everyone has their own board so you're not being blocked out of choices you move you recruit you pray things like that it's not bad it's just eh. you know i like the prayer mechanic as currency i think that's really smart but it's not much more than that so in general you don't like worker placement games where everybody has their own action board. But it's the same actions over and over. Like, it would have been nice if the, if some of the tiles that you picked up gave you different actions. I think there's only one tile that gives you, like, a little gold kind of chip that you can kind of oh, choose to get more actions. Yeah, but, three. yeah, but other than giving you oh, bonuses, each. they don't really do much more beyond that. So for Kemet, it's a play for me. I like the game. I played a couple times. I taught it to a couple of people. Cyclades really does have the artwork. Everything in that game is painted beautifully the screens the back of boards which you'll never see the creatures the artwork on the cards everything is of the highest quality you can you can tell that they really spent a lot of time on this i do like the metropolis kind of sit but i do understand that it does clunker and slow down a little bit you know because you really do have to think three or four moves ahead and when you do get to take your action because you you got that god on your side it's only one action that you're taking whereas Kemet, you're taking multiple actions. And, you know, Cyclades, you get to play those creatures, which is great. I got to play those creatures, but then they go away and I don't want you to go away. You're awesome. Now, Hades kinds of fixes that a little bit with the priestesses, but Cyclades is a play for me. I own the game, and I own the expansion for Hades, and I'm glad about that, and I'm hoping that um, the Titans expansion coming up will actually offer more to the game and kind of give you different possibilities. I'm going to agree with Chris on the Kemet board. Those lines are stupid. (laughs) <laughs> it's just they're pointless and stupid. Like it's just this wide open space. It's just mathematics. Week. You can make it smaller. You make the board smaller and have okay. normal space. Anyways, I'm not going to harp on that because it's not. I, I'm not generally bothered by that in games, but I do agree. <laughs> um, 
fact that Cyclades takes that much longer to play, and they, you know every round takes a certain amount of time with the bidding, and then you take one action at the end of it, it does make the game drag. And I don't think anybody's going to argue with that um, who's played it. It does drag a little bit. But I like it a lot more than Daniel does. <laughs> um, the, bid, the bidding mechanic is, is pretty cool. I mean, honestly, like, Drew, you said, like, it carries you most of the way you'd want to play it. Yeah. Me too. I like that a lot. Once I had enough money to bid on things, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> In terms of the game itself, obviously they're very different. Uh, Kemet, I like Kemet. I don't think I like it as much as any of you, honestly. It's not... Uh, for multiple player battle games like that can get very um, I don't even think it's necessarily like combative where people are like, getting upset with each other it's just if you get stuck in a bad position or um, you get to the point where you know you can't beat the person who you can actually reach because uh, they have all these defensive bonuses or something it's it gets frustrating and you can't do a lot against it um, it's just not my kind of game I didn't have as much fun with Kemet even though I thought it was a good game and I agree with you guys on that Cyclades is, is more my kind of game where you build a strategy over the course of many rounds. I feel like there is more to it than you, Daniel thinks. Um, because you do, if you plan it out in advance, like where you're going to go and how you're going to respond to other people, but it becomes one of those games where you have to think three, four, five rounds, and those rounds take so long that it's hard to do that. And then if somebody comes at you and throws some ridiculous numbers and messes up your strategy, it's just a huge waste of time. Um, so I would probably play both of them again definitely neither of these is a buy for me they're just not my kind of games and if i'm going to pick one of the two i'm going to lean towards Kemet because it's shorter and tighter but honestly it's pretty even for me yeah i mean for me it's, it's fun to play one round of cyclades see that bidding element in action and that's kind of cool and that was after that i didn't find any more moments that really drew me into cyclades and i mean when when the final turn came, right, it was the moment I love. An old friend of mine who I've gamed with for years uh, accurately diagnosed that my favorite moment in any game, and in fact most fiction and everything, is the aha, I've got you now. Like the big dramatic swing, right? I love that. Or where you see finally the plan is unveiled, right? And Cyclades, I won like that, right? It was Pegasus, move my entire army drop them on the metropolis that had been built with Achilles by this side, wipe them out, use Achilles' special power to build a second metropolis, win, right? Just this massive sweep. And I was so bored while I was doing it that it, I, I just, I can't understand how that happened, right? One of my favorite moments. It was like a, uh, uh, moment. It was, um, I uh, win. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool. Hey, would you guys want to take that that uh, graduated auction mechanic from Cyclades and like try it out in Power Grid? I think we'd all run out of money really fast. <laughs> <laughs> but really make us, you know, use our bids wisely. That's true. It's a really cool mechanic without a game to support it. Ah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I think the game's pretty good. I think both games need multiple plays, so you really get a sense of how things come together. And the way you kind of, you had the two mythological creatures and the hero came out, just happened to come out in that row. That come, happens randomly. So it might have been possible you not get that creature in a certain round, and you may not have been able to do both. It might have kind of put things on a different perspective. But the games do benefit from multiple plays to see how those things kind of chain together. I mean, in every game benefits from playing it more, but the question you have to make after a first play or a second play or whatever is, do I want to play it again? Right? Sure. I could play it more and more and invest more and more time in acquiring the taste, but is it worth acquiring that taste? And I think that it's not worth acquiring Cyclades as a taste. I think there are tons of better games out there. I would say I would agree with you with the exception of that it's different taste because the tiles cause different tastes. The mythological creatures that come out... Co we probably didn't. We didn't see half the mythological creatures and heroes come out there, so there was more to come. There was more possibilities. Yeah. The yeah. question is, are any of them interesting? Yeah. And reading through the rulebook and looking at the possibilities in the game, I don't think any of the possibilities of that sort, in fact, right? They're possibilities that have an immediate one-shot effect, and then they dissipate. It's just not interesting or intriguing to me. All right. So if I guess if you're trying to figure out which of these two games to pick up or which one to play, if both of them happen to be at your local game store, um, you now know what we think. 
Uh, I don't think there was anything definitive in there, unless you're Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> a very definitive statement. The rest of us were pretty on the fence about the, t- the three, or about the two. Um, well, at least try Kemet before you try Cyclades. Yeah. yeah I mean, sort of leaned a little in that direction. Yeah, it's a little quicker. It's a little more accessible, and it's easier to learn. I think a lot of, yeah. you know, in general, if you have the option between the two, I would lean Kemet. Yeah. Um, more variability of play style. Yeah, yeah. So, but overall, you know, obviously very divergent opinions, and you can see now that these are not the same game. So if you're trying to pick between the two, think about what kind of game you like and match it up based on that. But that is our feature review of Kemet and Cyclades. Uh, Kemet versus Cyclades, and <laughs> what we think overall. So if you have an opinion, which I'm sure you do, um, let us know. We want to know what you think between the two games, if you've played both of them, or if you've just played one and disagree or agree. Um, hop on the forums or uh, BoardGamersAnonymous.com and let us know uh, what you think and you know what your opinions are of these very divergent mechanics and um, you know if you think they carry the game or not. All right. Uh, so... We talked about at the beginning of the show that uh, we want you to tell us your favorite worker placement games. And this is the time of the show when we normally do our questions, but I don't have any this week because it was a short week. So we're going to go ahead and share our favorite worker placement games just kind of to give you a kickstart because we want you to answer the question. So these are our four just to get you going. Again, share yours too, and we're gonna, we'll, we'll throw them on the next week's podcast. See what happens when you don't ask us questions? We start asking and answering our <laughs> own questions. Exactly. And if you don't want to hear that, answer it. <laughs> well, worker, worker placement game with real workers in it. Um, I can't think of many people who work harder on their job than coal miners. And Coal Baron is really a good worker placement game not not overall a good game, but I think it's a good use of worker placement. First of all, it employs more people than just about any other worker placement game. You have like at least a dozen guys that you're putting to work, and that's good. High employment rates, low unemployment, and uh, you have a lot of options to keep your workers busy. Um, if the workers finish their job early and are bumped from their spot by someone else, they get to hang out at the uh, cafeteria and relax. So I think... <laughs> It's, you know, you get a lot of uh, good production out of your workers, and I think it treats them well. Um, It is a fun game. Not a strong game, but uh, a pleasant diversion as far as worker placement. Cole Baron. Well, those are good workers, but, you know, the real tough workers, they work the rails. True. And and there's no tougher rails than Russian railroads. So So in Russian railroads, your workers are doing a number of different things to upgrade their rails and move the different tracks along your victory points. So you'll get to build factories. You'll get to build different engines. And it's a lot of fun, and it's a really tight game. You actually get to do a lot of different interesting game things in the game. You know, uh, those are both great kinds of workers, but personally, my favorite kind of workers are the ones who whistle while they work as off to work they go, and dwarves. that would be the dwarves in Caverna. Uh, and I am not a fan of worker placement games, generally speaking, but I really enjoyed Caverna, so that should attest to its quality for those of you who have not played it. It is just fantastic. Those guys work hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think if you're going to pick a worker placement game, you might as well pick one that involves a lot less work. (laughs) Maybe a royal vacation of sorts, and that's Kingsburg. Kingsburg is a great worker placement game where you use dice instead of workers, because who cares what the workers look like? You're a royal! (laughs) Uh, it's, It's just a fun game where you get to, basically, your workers are different every turn, and you get to use this very diverse board to kind of build out your, uh, your victory points based on that. So it's that one was always a lot of fun to me. I feel like that kind of captures a unique aspect of worker placement where it's different all the time, um, right. and the expansion really adds to it. Okay. Right. So, so those are choices. four of our favorites, and if you want to hear three more, listen to last week's episode because we, <laughs> we picked out three others that were pretty awesome from uh, last year. So what do you guys like for worker placement games? All right. Yeah, we want to hear them because we'll probably like them too, and I'll probably want to play it because <laughs> we love worker placement. And if we haven't played Except it, for me, clearly we're going to play it on another podcast and see how they burst out against each other. Yeah, All right. <laughs> Which one's worthy of existing? <laughs> Our new segment. There can only be one. A worker placement World Cup. One. There you go. Ah. Ah. All right. 
All right. So that's everything for this week's episode. Once again, make sure you follow us on Twitter at BGA Podcast. We're on Facebook. Look for Board Gamers Anonymous. We have our own website, BoardGamersAnonymous.com. Tons of articles, this episode, show notes for this episode, and your comment box to tell us what kind of worker placement games you like and whether Kevin or Cicladies deserves to come out ahead. Uh, that's everything for this week, though. This is Anthony. This is Chris. This is Daniel. And this is Drew. And until next time, we'll save you a seat amongst the gods. Oh.